Good morning and a happy Sabbath to you all joining us this morning for this beautiful Sabbath service. We are glad that you decided to choose this platform to enjoy this lovely divine hour with us. To all our friends and family, church members, we want you to know that we miss you. Your seats are empty and we look forward to that beautiful day when we once more will join and unite as we worship God. But for now, my prayer is that we would remain faithful. May we pray for each other and trust God that when all this is said and done, that His name would be glorified. Be blessed. I hope that you all had a happy week and I want to wish you all a happy Sabbath this morning. So for story time this morning, I wanted us to talk a little bit about the Holy Spirit and what the Holy Spirit does in our lives. First, I want to read our memory text, which is taken out of Romans, Romans 5 verse 5. And it says, and hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given unto us. So the Holy Spirit is a gift that God has given unto us. And the Holy Spirit, as we know, is part of the Godhead. We have got God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit was even at creation in the beginning when the earth wasn't even formed yet. The Holy Spirit was hovering over the waters. So in John 16, it says that the Holy Spirit was sent to us as a helper. And as a helper, he is meant to be with us. So daily as we go about the things that we have to do on earth, the Holy Spirit is there and we all have access to him. So even as a child, if you are needing the help of the Holy Spirit, which we all do daily, you have access to the Holy Spirit. But how do we have access to the Holy Spirit and how does he lead us into all truth? We can't see him, but he's with us all the time. Even now while you're listening to me, the Holy Spirit is with you. So when we think about what the Holy Spirit does to us, I like to think of him as a little voice that tells us what is right from wrong. For example, let me think, um, maybe there is a new child at school and this new child doesn't have any friends to play with and when it's break time, they're just sitting on their own. And you know, you'll have that little voice in your head that will say, go and make friends with that child. She needs a friend and you can be a good friend. So off you go and you listen to that little voice in your head. Off you go and you make friends. Or um, teacher says, who did their homework? And yesterday you didn't feel like doing your homework. And um, But you don't want teacher to know that. So you're thinking to yourself, if I tell a little lie, then teacher will think that I'm a good child. But you have that little voice in your head saying, don't lie, you are, you are God's child. God doesn't want you to lie. And then you decide, I'm not going to tell a lie. That is that little voice that is telling you, leading you into truth, telling you not to make the bad choice, but to rather make a good choice. Now, when we don't have the Holy Spirit in our lives, it's easy for us to make those bad choices because we're not filled with the Holy Spirit. But when we ask Jesus to come into our hearts, and we ask the Holy Spirit to fill our minds and our, our bodies. He then guides us and he allows us to make the right choices. So I want to quickly have a little illustration to show you how the Holy Spirit, when we ask him to fill our lives, how he helps us to go from making the bad choices to the good choices. So on my table, I've got a clear glass representing a person. And this glass is empty at the moment, okay? Then we've got a, a, a little a note here that says bad choices. And then we've got good choices over here. I'm sure you can all see the arrows as you look through the glass. You can see the arrows and the arrows are pointing towards bad choices. And in this container over here, I've got some water. And in the Bible, the Holy Spirit is often represented by water. So if I decide not to have the Holy Spirit in my life, the choices that I make are often bad choices. I try to make the good choices, but you know what? I often make the bad choices. And then I decide to have Jesus in my heart. And when that happens, 
but I'm, I'm filled with the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit acts as my guide. And when he acts as my guide, something happens in my life. So let me fill this person up here with the Holy Spirit. I want you to watch the arrows. And as our lives become filled with the Holy Spirit, what happens everybody? Our bad choices now become good choices because the Holy Spirit has filled up our lives and our decisions are not bad decisions anymore. So as we go about this week again, I want you to remember to ask the Holy Spirit to fill your lives so that you can make good choices for Jesus and take those good choices into the environments that you have. And at the moment we're in lockdown, so we're at home. So I let those good choices be in the home with moms and dads. I just want to read Romans 5, verse 5 again, where it says, And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. Have a lovely week, boys and girls. Thanks for listening. Leviticus 27 verse 30 says, the Lord commands us one tenth of the produce of the land, whether grain from the fields or fruit from the trees, belong to the Lord and must be set apart to Him as holy. The tithe is not kept by the local church, but is sent on to the local conference and further appealed. Brethren and sisters, if you are not do not have snap scan, or if you are not able to do electronic transfers, please ask a board member to help you. A board member has been equipped to know how to, to do this. The Treasury are in the process of looking at other means of, of paying your offerings. Tithe unfortunately has to be done through the EFT system. Let us hold each other in prayer. The Lord is trying to speak to our world, but we got to remember we are His mouthpiece. Let us keep the church alive. Let us keep the word alive. Spread His word. The world needs Jesus. We need Jesus. Be safe. Keep safe. And keep each other in prayer. And please don't forget the rest of the world too.
And the broken, wounded soldiers, oh how much We need your precious healing hand We need the power of the cross As the only source for us When we stand up, facing final battle Cry, restore your church again Touch your people once again With your precious only hand We pray, let your kingdom shine upon the sun Through a living glorious church Not for temporary Through Jesus Christ. 
to the glory and praise of our God. Now we know that when we look at the book of Philippians, we first see that Paul is in prison and he's writing to Philippians who are very far away from him. They've sent a gift of money to him and a personal companion to try and keep him company. And Paul is trying to show his appreciation for one of these churches that he started. So he begins by his normal salutation that he gives, um, and we see it right through his letters. And when we look at Philippians chapter 1, there's four points that I want us to take away from this chapter. Firstly, we need to understand that Paul is praying amidst the persecution. And what's wonderful about it is that no matter how far away you are from someone else, you can still pray for them. And Paul prays for his friends who have heard that he's in prison. And uh, he's so gracious for, for their, their care and their love and the gift that he sent with one of the Philippians to him. So he starts off by saying, thank you so much for what you have done and may the grace of God be with you. And it's easy to understand that even though amidst the, the persecution that he was facing, the fact that he is in prison, he's still able to have a positive attitude because he knows why he is there and the greater purpose for this imprisonment. So it's easy to, to say that, well, in this circumstance, I cannot pray. But Paul is showing us that whatever circumstance you are in, you are able to pray. So we realize that even in times of persecution, whether we bring it upon ourselves, whether it's brought upon us, we are still able to pray. So even though his body is held captive, his prayers are unrestricted because even though he's in chains, he understands that God cannot be chained. He prays that the church in Philippi will be able to discern what is best for them and that they would be pure and blameless and that they would be filled with a good fruit that is in keeping with a proper relationship with Jesus Christ. So firstly, you can pray even in persecution. The second lesson that we glean from Philippians chapter 1 is that we need to replace our priorities with God's priorities. So what do we mean by that? In chapter 1, after praying for the well-being of the people in Philippi, Paul sets the task of teaching from verses 12 to verses 18. He wants us to learn how to live knowing that God is in control. We do this by taking God's view of things and not our view. Paul tells the Philippians that although there are people outside of prison who are trying to make life worse for him, he understands that these things are working for God's glory. It may seem crazy, but there were people who thought by continuing to preach in public and doing so for, for profit and uh, people that others thought weren't worthy of preaching, Paul still says, despite all those things, God's purpose is being fulfilled. You think that Paul would be upset that other people are taking the show or at the very least critical, but he is not. He responds by saying that this situation is turning out to be for the advancement of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We might say that Paul is gospel-centric in this instance because he rejoices that the good news is being preached, whether from good motives or not. The gospel is more important than his reputation or his personal comfort. And he understands that his imprisonment is for the sake of the gospel. He's not asking, why is this happening to me? Instead, he says that God is in control. Now, it's easy to agree with that statement or to say that in certain situations that God is in control. But the result of saying that God is in control means that I am not. And as humans, we are accustomed to being in control. We are in control of so many things in this world, but we do not have control over our own lives, our own choices. We don't have control over time or death. Now to say that God is in control, it means to say that I joyfully submit to the will of God. God is in control, even beyond the nasty motives of the people who are preaching out there, who put me in here, this is how Paul views his circumstances. 
that God is in control. Sometimes we are surrounded by people like Paul had in his life who were there for ill motives or were just trying to persecute him left, right and center. And I think our natural reaction would be to cry out to God, to ask him, God, why is this happening? Please stop these people from trying to harm me or trying to profit from my circumstance. But Paul simply rejoices that God's priorities are being accomplished. How about us today? Could we find joy in the middle of this circumstance that we are facing? With the assurance that God's priorities are happening. Just think about it. In this time, the gospel of Jesus Christ is being preached all over the world. God's kingdom is the highest priority. And Paul demonstrates this, that we must align our priorities with God's priorities. Whether we are in prison or free, we can experience peace and joy. Whether relationships or works or finances, whatever is going poorly, we can find peace and joy when we align our priorities with God's priorities. Paul was not teaching to the Philippians only. He was teaching us. So firstly, we can pray despite persecution, despite our circumstances. Secondly, no matter what happens, God is in control. The third lesson that we learn is that we need to trust God for the outcome. Now, from verses 19 to 26 of Philippians chapter 1, Paul says something very unusual and perhaps mysterious. He says that what happened will turn out for his deliverance. In other words, Paul's faith in God is in control. The fact that he's looking at the outcome, not the events. The events did not look promising for Paul. He's in prison. He's alone. He's far away from all that he knows. But he still says the outcome will be for my deliverance. Paul looks beyond the events toward the end. And here he concludes that the outcome will be glorious. Whether in his day or ours, here are the facts. Sorrow. Sickness and suffering are currently plaguing this world. But God shows His glory by bringing outcomes that are greater than any sorrow, sickness or suffering. Like Paul, we need to look beyond the current events and look towards the outcome. This is part of the glory of God, that in the midst of our weaknesses, in the midst of our wickedness, God is in the world working His wisdom for our good and for the good of our generations to come. In this first chapter of Philippians, Paul was not even concerned about his own personal outcome. He says, I can die and be with Jesus, or I can live, which will even be more fruitful ministry later in my life. Paul does not see his life as something to preserve, but rather as something to be spent in the service of God. This is part of the teaching of this chapter. How do we look at our lives? Do we look at the events or are we looking at the outcome? It means that if Jesus comes, the sooner the better. But if we live, our lives are an opportunity to come labor with God and be a blessing to others. The last lesson that we learned from Philippians chapter 1 is that we are to receive suffering. From verses 27 to 30, the Bible teaches us that we need to learn to live as if God is in control by receiving and suffering as something that is sometimes granted by God. Now we need to understand that no one should go looking for suffering. No one should bring harm to themselves or act foolishly or irresponsibly. Instead, we order our lives in the way that God teaches us to. But suffering comes as a result, not only because our way of life, but sometimes it comes despite living for God. In these last verses of chapter 1, Paul teaches us that we go through whatever happens together, God will be there for us. It is an expression not only of our individual confidence, 
but our confidence as one people. Any pastor can tell you that when you go through a period of difficulty, you either grow stronger spiritually or you lose faith in God. It is a community dynamic that the going gets tough if you are a follower of God. Paul says something that we don't hear quoted very often. He says, For it has been granted to you not only to believe, but to suffer for Him. The you in this verse is plural. It includes everyone. Those that Paul wrote to in the book of Philippians and those of us living today. The Philippians used Paul's imprisonment as a chance to express their love as a community towards him. And this makes sense to us and to me today. We see times of hardship as a way to respond and to show God's love to others. The church draws together during these tough times. Maybe we should ask ourselves, why should we wait for times like these to happen? Why wait until tragedy strikes to show our love and care for those around us? Why wait until things are bad in order to show the love of God? We can be a church that lives in the community and demonstrates community right now, even in the moments of suffering that we are facing. And this is the great lesson of Philippians chapter 1. That as an individual and a community, we can show and demonstrate that God is in control. Our actions should be our message. Our lives should be the good news. And we can demonstrate to the watching world that despite this COVID-19 virus, we confidently believe God is in control. I've wondered about this question. If you lost everything, would Jesus be enough for you? The question has been nagging me since the start of all these things that happened to us, restrictions, lockdown. And sometimes I wanted to puff out my chest and say, yes, no, absolutely without a doubt. God will be enough for me. It's the right answer, but I'm not sure that it was the honest answer. Sometimes we say everything will only be okay if it's Jesus plus. Jesus plus a wife or husband. Jesus plus a good job. Jesus plus healthy children. Jesus plus a home. Jesus plus financial security. Most of us come to faith with a hidden list of requirements, stipulations for what God must do for us so that we can be content to say, is having Jesus enough? And as Paul was sitting in that cell, cold, dark, black, hungry, Jesus was enough for him, despite the lack that he had. King Solomon says in Ecclesiastes chapter 1 verse 2, that when he had more than enough, all is vanity. Because all it was, was a yearning and a striving for things that would not satisfy. Perhaps we should ask ourselves, even if we lose everything amidst this crisis, we can look to Paul in that cold cell, alone, destitute, hungry, suffering, but still has the faith in God to write and encourage people outside to say, don't worry about me, because though it seems that I am alone, God is in control. That is why I can pray even though I am persecuted. That is why I can understand that it's not about my view, but God's priorities. It's not about the events currently happening. It's about the outcome. And that's why I will receive suffering for the sake of Jesus Christ. I planned my life from a young age. You now growing up, we used to hear the stories of my great-grandfather who served in the military. 
And uh, growing up, we would see his medals at my auntie's home, and they would tell us the stories about him. And, and it was at that moment that I decided I wanted to, to also join the military. I wanted to make my, my family proud. And so I, I did my best at school. I, I worked on every aspect, physically, my health and my, my studies. And uh, it was in grade 11 when uh, I just started getting thinner and thinner. And I didn't know what was going on, you know, my mother actually said that uh, she's going to take me to the doctor and she did and she said testing for, for drugs. Uh, fortunately, I was not taking any drugs and uh, they didn't diagnose the problem, they didn't know what the problem was. And uh, it was in grade 11, uh, one of the normal school days and I just didn't feel well. I lost a lot of weight and I was weak and uh, at that time we were living on the out of the college premises and so I told the, my teacher that I need to go home um, and he could probably see that something wasn't right with me so I need to go home and as I was walking the way back uphill towards the accommodation and then I just collapsed and I fainted and when I woke up I woke up in hospital and they told me that I could have died because my sugar levels were just high and uh, the machine actually said hi, it couldn't give, you, give, us, uh, give them a reading. And uh, it didn't register yet, so uh, the first thing that I thought about was that um, my mother was there and I asked her, can you just phone the recruitment office and yeah, if I can still join the army because they told me that I had been diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, which is a chronic condition. And when she phoned, they said that I won't be able to join because of my chronic illness and uh, my hopes, my dreams were dashed right there. I didn't know what I was going to do. I was in control and I was accustomed to being in control and at that moment I lost control. I didn't know which way to go forward from there. But it was there in that hospital bed that I was flipping through the channels there and uh, there was this video of a man with no arms and no legs and he's preaching in a stadium to thousands of people and uh, as I was listening, they, they, they interviewed him and asked him, what was your inspiration? How did you get to this point? And he said that he came across the story of the man born blind from birth, where the disciples asked Jesus, was it this man's sin or the sin of his parents that caused him to be like this? And Jesus answered, he was born this way so that God could be glorified. And through that experience, I was able to start on a journey of recovery and to realize that in that situation when I lost everything, it was in that time that God revealed His purpose. That I could understand that God is still in control. Despite that physical chain that I still live with, I do not look at the event. I must look at the outcome. That God will be glorified. And that no matter what happens, I can say with Paul, to live, it's okay, to die, even better, because God is in control. And soon and very soon, He will come to end all sin, sickness, weakness, suffering and pain, and we'll be with Him forever. Amen. Lord, we thank You so much that You have inspired Paul so many years ago to write down these words that those of us living today can understand that firstly despite any persecution or trial or challenge that we face we can still pray we thank you God that despite our vision we know that we should adopt your priorities because you are still in control Lord we pray that you will help us to realize that at the end even though we should receive suffering we know that you will never leave us nor forsake us. And at this moment I want to pray that you will be with each and every person that can hear my voice. That you will be close to them. That you may forgive them for their sin. That you may strengthen them. That you may provide for them. And that if they are ill, that you may heal them. And above all else, O God, that they will realize that you are still in control. And that in a short time, all the suffering in this world shall end when you come on the clouds of glory. We pray, O oh God, that you will bless us 
and that you'll help us to remain faithful to you. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.